living there for 31 years, so I say it well. <laughs> it's a Nahuatl word that means birds and flowers. So I live in the land of lovely things. And I feel like I'm in the midst of wonderful people. Really. I feel like I'm home. Thank you. I want to say gracias a todos y todas. <laughs> Notice when I speak in Spanish, I kind of move a little more. <laughs> I went over this morning to the Spanish gathering and they were dancing at 8.30. They were just moving and moving outside the doors. So um, if you want to make me feel like home, make funny faces if you don't understand me. And move. Um, you can even go like this if you don't like it. But um, anyway, I'm really humbled to be here. Um, I will be moving so that I don't neglect you and that baby full of God. She really is my PowerPoint. <laughs> I will not forget that. Um, I have a title for what I want to share, but I do want to say a few things first. Um, I want to say that I came to Rome on a very large plane. Uh, but I came to Rome, I think, to remember, uh, to recommit, and to rejoice. I came here really, I think, like you, wanting to celebrate our charism toward boundless loving. So my talk really is, let God be God, and let love be love. So if you don't remember at the end to what to write down on a paper, that's it. Let God be God and let love be love. What a joy to be with family who can make sense out of that with me. Okay. Let me start a little. Can you hear me? I don't know why there's two, maybe because he had a buddy. Uh, is it better like this or like this? Yeah. Okay. You know, most people when they get to a microphone would say, can you hear me? I think Vincent would say, can you see me? Can you see me? I'm asking you, can you see me? Because that's part of it too, the withinness of me. All right? That's another thing for your slip. <laughs> uh, let me start by focusing just a little about Vincent, his gift to the church and to the world. The saints, those friends of God, who left a profound impression on humankind and the church, did so because they discovered a new dimension to Christianity, a new way of living, a new way of reading gospel. In the midst of a hostile environment of Jansenism, where original sin and human depravity was afflicting everyone in the church and society, Vincent reacted strongly, searched his own heart, and gradually affirmed that grace God's loving presence is not merited, but rather it is freely given, it is pure gift, freely given to everyone. Fired up with this belief, Vincent, through prayer and action, comes to know that there is no way to step or stop the wave of love. The love of God is unstoppable. So Vincent boldly loves with the awareness that God is love, and the human person is able to love with the divine love that has been poured out freely into every human heart. Yes, for Vincent, human holiness is an encounter of human love with divine love, especially in the person of the poor. <coughs> Vincent did not see the road to holiness as some direct path that led to God, but rather as a path that moved in one direction 
then another, and still another. It was more like the wisdom of God that mystics possess, not the result of knowing, but of savoring. Not so, so much mindfulness, but heartfulness. I don't know about that's an English word, but I think it should be. Heartfulness, no? Yeah. Vincent believed and lived paradoxes. Humility and audacity. Action and mysticism. Firmness and gentleness. Perseverance and flexibility. Intelligent activity and trusting surrender. <coughs> Always both and. The heartfulness I'm referring to is more the result of a deep encounter by seeing the withinness of the other, the withinness of everything, the withinness of himself. It gives me joy to mention this here, here in Rome. Vincent truly believed in partnership in the church, and that is why he listened learned and trusted the instincts and wisdom of Louise. Together, they imagined and gave birth to a movement that has inspired us all. They started a revolution of tenderness, a revolution to humanize and put a face on the stranger and the vulnerable. Our founders knew the need to lock eyes and to join hearts with those to whom human dignity and human rights were denied. With zeal, with a passion, Vincent and Louise responded to human needs and organized institutions to keep charity alive, keep love expressed. Yes, we are witnesses to and partners with them in that long evolution of service. Service given in both humility and simplicity. Vincent and Louise instructed all of us, the Vincentian family, to ask forgiveness of those receiving our help, receiving our love. How well they knew that the giver is the getter, and the getter is the giver. You got it? <laughs> it really was, it truly is, love touching love. Two stories. These feel like right in my eyes. <laughs> Two stories. I have lived in El Salvador during the Civil War, and um, I've been there for 30 years, but during the war, I remember one time I was with a group of people who were just moving. They weren't living in any one place. And I happened to visit them um, without permission from the military because I was attending an emergency. And I was the only one in the house when the emergency came and we were supposed to leave in twos. They wanted to know where we were all the time. The military forces in my town of Suchitoto. But anyway, um, after I took care of the emergency in this little town of Montepeque, that town got word, or this group of people, they got word that the military forces were coming through, maybe, because a, a runner comes with information, you know, and sometimes it was a false alarm, sometimes no. Well, the community decided that they were going to leave. So they all, we all, got in the back of a very large truck, not a pickup, like a sand truck, huge. And uh, we started moving, and for some reason the driver made a left turn. And that really wasn't the road. So needless to say, um, we went over a little embankment and we could not break the truck. <coughs> so we ran into a field of tall grasses. So I wound up with two other women. Step there. I wound up with two other women, women, and one had a baby. So she took off the truck, her basket, and of course I left my backpack. I had my paper, 
drills in my pocket and that's all I needed. It was like a fire drill in school, you just leave the building, you know? And uh, the three of us were together, we separated in case the military forces came and we got rounded up and we met them could run easily in small groups. Anyway, about three in the morning, we all woke up at the same time. <coughs> so the mother decided she was going to change her baby. And she opened the basket. First out came a stack of tortillas. That's our staple. And they were always wrapped in like a, a dish cloth. Uh, something to dry the dishes with. Ow. Well, I'm a nervous eater and I was nervous. And I'm looking at the tortillas. Oh, I couldn't believe it. And the lady next to me, as soon as she saw the tortillas, she made a gesture. Oh no, she said, we can't eat your food. You have to feed the baby, and you have to keep up your strength. And the woman who had the tortillas, her gesture was, oh no, she said, tonight we share our food. Tomorrow, we share our hunger. That was one of the times Peggy said, oh God, you're staying here. <laughs> I'm staying here. One more story. <coughs> as Sisters of Charity and Sisters of St. Francis living together, uh, to do things that other people in the community couldn't do. Meaning, we were church representatives and we had U.S. passports. And the people trusted us. And one day somebody came to the house and said, there's a fresh head in the park. And so we were able to go and get that head off the stake with a little sign, I'll make it short, I won't library. But anyway, we were able to get Alf, uh, we called him El Afro, because he had great hair, El Afro. He was 18. We were able to bury the head with the parents. Again, you can do that surreptitiously, get into them. But I want to tell you I have a deep love. I'm a sister of charity of St. Elizabeth, and I have a deep love for the mystery of the visitation. So, um, one of my dear sisters of charity, Mary Kahneman, she gave me a very beautiful photo of a, of a sculptor, a piece of sculpture of the visitation. But it was very modern. It was just like two rocks, two stones. But I knew what it was. I could see it. I could see the withinness of these stones. And uh, I said to myself, as I left my house in Jersey, City, New Jersey, to go back to the people, who had just come from a refugee camp, I'm going to bring the visitation picture. And I put it in the nursery. <clears throat> I got there late at night. You had to go by boat to this community. And um, all the women were there. And I said, I bought you this because you will really identify with these two women. They both lost their sons. And you have lost so many. <laughs> and, uh, so they said, oh yes, now who are they? Mary, they certainly knew, because she was the mother of Jesus. And, but they weren't quite sure about Elizabeth, Elizabeth, you know? And they said, tell us how he died. Well, I looked out and saw the mother of El Afro in the group. Mom, she's still alive. And um, I said, oh, to myself, oh, no, no, no. Don't tell that story tonight. She'll never go to sleep. No lie. So I uh, said, well, I'll tell you in the morning. We'll read the scripture. We'll get into the story. It was a base Christian community. And um, they insisted, so I told the truth. I looked out, and as soon as I said her son was beheaded, I could feel the silence in the room. It was pregnant with worry about Martha. And Martha looks at me, because I'm holding this framed picture, and uh, I hear, I see first a few tears, and she whispered, somebody knows my pain. And then she said, over and over again, by the time she got to me, gracias a Dios, somebody knows my pain. Thanks be to God, somebody knows my pain. And I said to myself, oh, baby, now you believe in the communion of saints. But that story, the energy of that life, that gesture, 
of, of that son and her receiving that news. Wow. Well, she came to me and she was weeping. She was dancing. I can, and all the women left. They kind of left with that story uh, in their heart. And I just held her for about 20 minutes. And then we both left in white and we both slept. So we're talking about solidarity. We're talking about solidarity. There's a Nicaraguan poet who calls it La tenura entre los pueblos, the tenderness between peoples. They're talking big sense. Imagine, we were told our chapels, our shrine places were the city streets. We were told to leave God for God. Not that prayer was unimportant, but oh, how overwhelming to both Vincent and Louise was the deep awareness, the deep realization that presence, grace freely given is everywhere. Everything, everyone is sacred. Vincent and Louise were fully awake to their troubled times, and they risked responding to it in new ways. They challenged church, society, and each other when necessary with hope, and deep confidence that their project, their ministry, was truly of God. <laughs> Clearly, we have come to this holy city to recommit ourselves to boundless loving. So I ask each of us, how do we stay awake? How do we stay faithful in our times, in our contexts? 400 year later, years later, what is the spiritual revolution needed to transform us and our world. What and how should we teach by our actions and our words to a world so broken, a world so far from the dream of God? I want to invite you. No, I want to challenge all consensions to look deeply inside the mystery of the Trinity. Yes? to ponder this displaced, this forgotten doctrine. For too long, this doctrine has been the stranger, waiting again to be welcomed, waiting to show us how to live. Actually, I want to suggest we need a Trinitarian revolution, nothing less. Like you, I thought, very little about the Trinity because I was told it's a mystery. You can't understand it, just believe it. Does that sound familiar? Richard Raw says, and I quote, mystery is not something you cannot understand, but rather mystery is something you can understand endlessly. Mystery is something you can understand endlessly. True, there's no point at which you can say, ah, I've got it. Rather, my friends, always and forever, mystery gets us. Mystery holds you, mystery holds us. You experience mystery, you experience love, you savor it. This understanding of Trinity cannot come a moment too soon. Our world is so broken, so disconnected, so afraid, so longing to be healed, a world so in need of love. Are we ready to admit that we have trespassed on the fullness of God, the fullness of mystery, by trying to lock God in a religion, a book, a person, a gender. Can we only think in nouns? Is it too late to reverb? Can we finally confront Aristotle, who puts forth the theory that substance is always over relationship? A more refreshing current theology of Trinity can enliven faith in a way that is not just rooted in our own tradition, but in all, in all wisdom, experience, and love. I ask us, will we let God be God? 
Will we let love be loved? Catherine Maury Lacuna, in her classic book, God for Us, proposes that Trinity is not ultimately a teaching about God, but rather a teaching about personhood. She insists that God is absolute relatedness. And the foundational good news is that creation and humanity have been drawn into this flow of loving relationship, the gift of relating lovingly. In fact, she tells us that the life of God does not just belong to God alone. Everything is holy. Everything is connected. God is the life force of everyone. There are no strangers. This must become our mantra, the Vincentian mantra. There are no strangers. What was budding in the hearts of Vincent and Louise is beginning to flower. Everything, everyone is invited to be a part of this three-part harmony, this holy communion, this radical relationship. Humanity is created in the image of community, in the image of the Trinity. Today, scientists confirm for us that everything is interrelated. They tell us that everything that exists is never stable and is nothing but a jump from one interaction to another. The Italian scientist, I choose him because of where we are, Carlo <laughs> Rovelli, he suggests that we should no longer talk about the Big Bang, but rather the Big Bounce. Things moving, emerging, relating. Everything is marinated in this. Trinity is not just a teaching about the life of God, but about the life of personhood. Let me suggest this is the spiritual paradigm shift I think our world needs. God is not a being, but interbeing, absolute relatedness. I want to suggest we do not look at the Trinity as spectators, as outsiders. Rather, we are all invited into this dance of love, into this wave of love that is unstoppable. God is not the dancer, but the dance. Start thinking movement. Start thinking verbs. Start thinking relationships, not just substances. God is the dance, not the dancer, and we are part of this very dance. Lakutna also tells us that we praise God by building right relationships. And sin is destroying right relationships. Stop thinking and speaking about bonds. Start thinking and speaking about bonds with an N. Bonds. Say bonds. Uh -huh. Just to make sure you've heard of the difference between bonds and bonds, okay? Start thinking and speaking about bondings. Atomic bombings? No. Atomic bondings? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll do it again. Atomic bondings? Yes. yes. <laughs> Here are the questions. Will we try to midwife new metaphors for this creative energy and this creative power that continues to invite us to renew the face of the earth? Will we try to use our creativity to find new ways to nourish and sustain our spirits? Will we swim and dance in the spirituality burst out of, out of the awareness that we truly praise God when we build right relationships with people and with all other species on this planet? And that sin is destroying relationships. Will we let this sink into our souls and have it shape the way we touch our planet, our borders, the way we use, share, all natural resources? Who is our neighbor? 
The Good Samaritan, yes. The Syrian refugees, yes. The children sold for sex, yes. And the sea turtles, the bees, and the butterflies, yes. Oh, how we have come to see the vastness of creation and its real connectedness, its real relatedness. And we must reread all the faith stories in this context and see and feel them emerging, being liberated with new meanings to, to see them evolving. <coughs> I am so happy I've lived long enough to see the radical doctrine of the Trinity emerging, opening up like a beautiful flower, all that is, is birthed and connected by this loving movement, this incessant verb. Yes, I stand in awe at how the early Cappadocian fathers speak about mystery, speak about God after Jesus. They express this as love flaring forth, love expressed, received, returning, transforming, connecting, expanding, invading, inviting. What insight? And they tell us we are made in the image and likeness of God, of this mystery. Let me mention here, there's a new book I found thinking about this, like 2017, and thinking about this talk. It's called The Cappadocian Mothers. <laughs> Sundberg, Carla Sundberg is the author. She explores the ways in which the holy lives of seven Cappadocian women, relatives of the three great theologians, Bagel and the two Gregories. These Cappadocian women bring greater clarification and understanding to the theology that the fathers are struggling to express. These women give life to the language of the Cappadocian fathers. It becomes impossible to separate these women from their theology or their theology from these women. While the women did not preach or publish, they shaped the character of their close male relatives. They were examples of holiness, generously giving and compassionate caring. And for these theologians, they truly reflected the image of God. In fact, these women embodied what they were struggling to write about. They saw these women as living examples of deification, theosis, that life force within each of us. We call it G-O-D. <laughs> we do not just look at Trinity as spectators, marveling and imitating. Rather, mystery invites us to live within the flow express and the breeze, and that to be part of the harm harmony. Listen to this um, a US poet, or maybe she was British. Tell me at the end. Uh, she says this, Emily Dickinson. All right? She says this, listen to Emily Dickinson. In the name of the birds, the butterflies in the breeze, amen. I want to do this all the time. Yep. Can we not say, in the name of Vincent, Nelson Mandela, and Gandhi, amen. That amen. life force. In the name of peacemakers, caregivers, and Vincentians, amen. Amen. Listen, I went to DePaul University. Uh, oh, I forget when, last year maybe. And uh, the first night I went to a, uh, to have supper at your house uh, in Denver. Anybody can come in and eat on the campus, imagine. Well, I went, that was almost like a worker house. And uh, they had meal prepared and we had wonderful conversation. And of course, I was a guest, so I was talking. But that night, two young women were fil filming for another class that uh, ministry on campus the Vincent and Louise house. And so um, they came over to thank me. And um, I got to talking to one of them. She happened to be a young woman of color. And as she talked, I said to her, would you happen to be Catholic? And she said, oh no, she said, I'm Baptist, but I'm Vincentian. 
<laughs> I will never, ever forget that phrase. I hope it's my sisters. Put it in the coffin. I want to remember that phrase. <laughs> so, let us say this. In the name of Vincentian Baptists, Vincentian Buddhists, and Vincentian Catholics, Amen. We belong to each other and the creative force you and I call God is responsible for that. That force, that energy is what connects everything, everyone. Yvonne Guevara, Brazilian theologian, calls God the sap of life, the life force of everything. Will we let this disturb us, call us to see a real responsibility to treat everyone with tenderness, live in real solidarity? Will we wake up from our isolation, from our inhumanity? According to Ilia Delio, to be Catholic, to be human, is to live in conscious evolution, to be actively engaged in this unfinished universe as co-creators of justice, peace and mercy. Catholicity is a virtue of relatedness, a dynamic energy of whole making, of solidarity, solidaridad. Megan Clark reminds us that solidarity is an attitude, a virtue, a duty. It is not a vague feeling of compassion or a shallow stress at the misfortune of people. It is waking up to the scandals that surround us staring at them, weeping over them. Solidarity is the virtue by which we strive to be more fully the Trinity. It is feeling the pain, the love, the loneliness of the other. Gustavo Gutierrez, theologian, biblicist, Peruvian, now at Notre Dame University. He has in one of his books on Job, something like this. You know, we read the apocalypse a lot in Latin America because we know it's a metaphor and we don't get frightened. We name the demons. But in one part of the book of the apocalypse, there's a saying, the angels will be waiting for us when we pass over, when we die, to wipe away our tears. And Gustavo says, woe to you who come dry-eyed. Woe to you who have not felt the pain of the world, who have not felt your own pain. Woe to you. To be human is to have open arms, to embrace, to build, to heal, to let the life force pass through us and meet the very life force of the other. But to be human is also to make fists in the face of those structures that rob people of their humanity, that indicate that they are not wanted or do not deserve rights, dignity, a safe place to live and grow. The heart of the message of Pope Francis is the radical, uncompromising nature of solidarity. He minds us by words and actions that we have fallen into the globalization of indifference, an attitude that all does not concern us. It's none of our business. He warns us that we cannot embrace our own humanity if we do not embrace the humanity of the other. Until exclusion and inequality in society are reversed, it will be impossible to eliminate violence. Without equal opportunities, the different forms of aggression will find fertile grounds, fertile terrain, and eventually will explode. Violence will keep recurring no matter how much military might we use to suppress it. May I stress in this moment of time, we all need to shout by words and actions to everyone we serve. Get a life, get a real life. Get a life not measured by stock portfolios or the manic pursuit of material consumption. Rather, get a life where together we envision and build a circle of compassion with no one standing outside of it. Let us give each other hope that a humane civilization can and will be made concrete by considering first the community rather than the individual. When we leave this symposium, 
when we go home. When we leave this symposium, when we head back home with all of the positive shared energies from the gathering, I ask you to remember that despite so much in common among us, there is one thing you have that no one else has. Yes, you are and will be the only person alive who has the sole custody of your own heart, your own deepest center. You can Google for an answer. You can Google for a mate, for a career. But you cannot Google to find what is in your own heart, the passion that lifts you upward. You have to listen to what is inside of you. Discover your own fire. Not only do you need your own fire, but so does the whole world. More than ever, the world needs economic structures, economic systems that are built on solidaridad, on the tenderness between pueblos. More than ever, the world needs to rethink borders, welcome the other as kin, not as stranger. More than ever, we need to build bridges, not walls. We built walls in the 14th century. We cannot amputate our creativity. We must risk, peek around corners, travel to places where there are palpable longings for justice and peace. Yes, I repeat, we must stare at how inhumane humanity is. More than ever, we must be awakened by the scandals we see, the scandal of hunger, planned absence of education, excessive violence, the corruption and impunity of so many of our institutions, the scandal of excessive greed. If we do not perceive the scandals, we will never act. We must see and feel the pain of the world to be a part of this new birthing. Remember, woe to you who come dry eyed. Let us gather here these days with a genuine attitude of gratitude, knowing that God still has faith in us and knowing that we still have faith in each other. In the end, it is love that matters. Let us promise to touch each other in our world with a tenderness that transforms, with a truth that challenges. Ours is an age of something radically new. It is more than a reformation. It is an evolution in love an evolution in solidarity, a love, as we can sentient say, a love inventive to infinity. Gracias.